We are very honored uh, to have uh, Dr. Diane Langberg, clinical psychi psychologist, and Dr. Phil Monroe, clinical psychologist and professor uh, running the, the counseling program at Biblical Seminary. We are so honored that they have voluntarily served as the co-chairs of uh, the Trauma Healing Advisory Council. Many of the council members are here in addition to Phil and Diane. But they've just really helped to uh, guide us so that we um, are basing this work not only on good exegesis of the Bible, but solid <coughs> mental health practices. Every year uh, they have contributed and spoken at our COP. These speeches are on our website, the Trauma Healing Institute, and, and you can view some of the ones from earlier years. But uh, we're now, please welcome Phil and Diane as they give us the keynote address. I think it's fine. Can you hear me? No. Is it that one? Ha. Huh? Never mind. <laughs> Good morning. And as always, it is a great honor to be here and get to know some of you as new faces and many of you as familiar and loved faces and hear about what God is doing not only in your lives but through your lives to others. We're going to talk this morning and some tomorrow about power. It is uh, something that is often abused in this world, as you know. And much of the trauma that you work with is the result of those abuses. And so I think it's very important for us to understand power, what it is, uh, how it's misused, and also what God says about it. So power, to begin, is simply the ability to do something or to influence. It can mean anything from the capacity to influence another or it could mean things like to have leverage, or to dominate, or to coerce, or to master someone. Every single human being has power. By our sheer presence in the world, we have made an effect. We're taking up space. We're here. The two-month-old infant who wakes in the middle of the night screaming has the power to raise very independent grown-ups out of a sleep that they much desire and need. Now those grown-ups have power over the infant as well, don't they? And they can respond with attention and care, or they can respond with anger and abuse at being disturbed, or they can withhold power and neglect. All responses affect and shape the child. Power is inherent in every human being and it can be used for good or evil and it can be withheld also for good or evil. In Genesis, we read about how God invested humans with power from the beginning. He says, let us make humans in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule. He told them to be fruitful and to rule and to subdue. Humans who are fruitful increase their power simply by creating more humans. Rule and subdue are pretty clearly power words. The Hebrew for rule means dominion or dominate. The word for subdue means to conquer or to subjugate or to keep under. It also can have very negative meanings like put in bondage or force or violate or tread underfoot. In that same verse, it says that God created image, uh, humans in his own image in his likeness. Now, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Hopefully, yourself. <laughs> and if you don't, you might see a psychologist. <laughs> the person you reflect, that, that is reflected to you in the mirror has your nose and your hair and your smile. <clears throat> Power was given to humans who reflected God and who he is. And what do we know about him? He is good. He is faithful. He is a refuge, he is truth, he is love, and so humans were made 
reflecting those qualities of God. And power was given to humans who bore the character of God. And we are told God blessed them. He pronounced a benediction over them. We all know what happened after that. A seemingly beautiful creature who had utterly rejected the power of God or any likeness to him came and deceived the human beings, and this part's important, using God's own words. You want to be like God, he said? You can do that by choosing what he has denied you. And like the enemy, the humans then chose to use their power against God and took what appeared good for food and fed on it. They use their power to choose evil, power that ought to have been used to choose good. Power used by those who bore the character of God in the flesh became power used by those who bore a likeness to the enemy of God. That power is not then power to bless. It becomes power to harm. Not just others, but the self as well. So we're going to look more closely at this thing we call power so we can better understand what kind of power we have and how it can be used for good or evil, for healing or for harm. Now the issue of power and its accompanying deception seems to have been a frequent topic of discussion in recent years. We hear in the media about power and its abuse by individuals. We hear about it within families in churches, and certainly within political circles and within governments. We hear about deception and how cover-ups have been carried on for years by large institutions, organizations, and churches. These are critical topics for us to consider and understand if we work with trauma. And as most of you know, I am a Christian psychologist, and I have for 45 years had two specialty areas. One of those has been trauma of many kinds. I have worked with men and women who've been sexually abused as children and assaulted as adults. I've worked with domestic violence, clergy sexual abuse, sex trafficking, and victims of other things such as kidnapping, torture, genocide, and war. Running down a second track, I have spent many years working with those in Christian leadership, pastors, missionaries, elders, professors, and heads of Christian organizations, those called to use their power to bless, but who instead have controlled the intellects, the hearts, and sometimes the sex lives of their sheep, using the sheep as food for themselves and their goals rather than feeding the sheep God called them to serve. And also then many who have covered up such abuses theoretically for the sake of God's work. In other words, others have withheld using their power for good out of fear and self-protection. So needless to say, I have seen untold damage done to the precious body of Jesus Christ in his name. And so it's for the sake of that body and that wonderful name that I believe we need to wrestle with the issues of power and its abuses. Now you here in this room are involved in some kind of ministry or caregiving. Many of you are in high positions of leadership. That means you are in relationships where you hold power in vulnerable and broken lives. You are part of a community of trauma healing, which means you minister to many who have been abused and traumatized by power used wrongly. I believe that you care about the body and the name of Christ. I know that you do not want to hear the word woe from the throne of God, which is what he spoke to the shepherds of Israel who fed on the sheep. He said this, those who are sickly you have not strengthened, the distressed you have not healed, the broken you have not bound up, the scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. You hear the withholding of power for good in some of those words? But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. You have used your power for evil. These shepherds 
misused their God-given power and allowed the flock to become prey. God's response was to remove his flock from their care. I believe that those of you in this room desire to care for and protect the sheep of our God in this world. You do not want them to become prey to you or to anyone else. So out of honor for that desire and concern for the sheep and the glory of God, I want to put some thoughts for you this morning, <clears throat> give you some thoughts about power. So we've defined it. It's the ability to make things happen, to influence. We have noted where our power as humans originated. It's part of God's image in us. And we have also noted that that part of our image, along with everything else, is now twisted and easily abused. It is important to note through all of this that though all of us have power, not all of us feel powerful. Many humans feel powerless, some in certain contexts and some all the time. So many of you have lived or traveled in poverty-stricken areas or spoken with, say, a sexual assault victim, and you have witnessed experiences of utter powerlessness. Any of you who have parented small children have had bad days when you felt tired and needy and weak and utterly powerless, but you knew you had the power to damage your children. In fact, fragilities and weaknesses do not necessarily remove our power at all. They do, however, make us much more likely to use that power destructively. So we are most in danger the weaker or needier we feel because we are far more likely to neglect or use those under our care to feed ourselves. Those who feel powerless or inadequate often abuse power. And I suspect that trauma and abuse of power in their lives is in part the story behind why young men around the world are becoming what we call radicalized. It is also important to note that power is not a fixed trait. It varies across contexts. So for example, I have power with my two grown sons simply because I am their mother. However, they are 6'2 and 6'5. So they have the greater physical power. It shifts. A dynamic and brilliant CEO of a huge corporation may wield tremendous power over many people, but you put him in front of his critical mother with whom he has many unresolved issues and you will watch his power seemingly vanish, which actually may in turn feed his need to abuse his power in the home. His sense of powerlessness in one arena may be the very thing driving his reach for great power in another. Now we can't talk about power without also discussing the flip side, which is vulnerability. When someone is vulnerable, it simply means they are susceptible to being wounded, <coughs> to attack, or to injury. The word comes from a Latin word, which means to wound. So a woman in a room full of men is physically vulnerable. A client in a counselor's office is vulnerable. A patient in a doctor's office. A child with a parent. Citizens of a country are vulnerable to tyrannical governments. Whenever power is used in a way that wounds the vulnerable or exploits trust, we call that abuse. The word abuse basically means to use wrongly, to misuse. When a person with power uses another for his own ends, discards or destroys another, abuse has occurred. The shepherd has used the sheep for food. There are also different kinds of power. So I'm going to just give you a few. It's not an exhaustive list. The first is the obvious one, and that's physical power. The bigger and the stronger have power over the smaller and the weaker. Usually, again, a male with a female, a parent with a child, a teen with a small child. But physical power can also be not just size. It can also be this sense of presence that someone has. And I'm sure you've all known somebody whose personality and charisma fill up the room and dominate it. 
it gives a sense of largeness even if their physical size is not that great. Another kind of power is verbal. People who have a command of words, people who are articulate, can dominate a conversation, a room, a relationship, a group, or an entire nation. We often use words to sway others, to move them toward what we want. Words may be used to influence, to shape, to encourage, but words can also be used to humiliate, to deceive, to maneuver, and control others. You think of the power of the words of Martin Luther King and the tremendous influence he had. And then you think of the power of the words of Adolf Hitler and the tremendous influence he had on people for evil. You think of times when you have used words to titillate or to condemn or to shock because it met some need in yourself. It served your end in some way. Or you also think about times when you perhaps have withheld words to self-protect because you didn't want to be destroyed or disturbed or to cover something up. So you used your power to withhold your power. Think of other times when you've used words to lift up, to affirm, to give hope. Verbal power is a tremendous power. A third kind is emotional power. Spouses have this kind of power over each other. Parents and children wield that kind of power. I have emotional power over my clients. People can wield power also by their moodiness or sensitivity. In essence, they hold everybody around them in bondage to whatever they're feeling at the moment. That's why we talk about walking on eggshells around somebody. We're trying to prevent a particular mood from descending or being aggravated. Spouses that punish by withdrawal refusing to talk for days on end or weeks, are using emotional power to damage another. Preachers can use emotional power to sway or convince church members for good or ill. Rulers use emotional, uh, emotional power. And when emotional power and verbal power are combined and attached to the longings that human beings have within them, it is very easy to get their obedience. You can move an entire nation with verbal and emotional power and an understanding of the longings in people's hearts. So listen to some words that have both emotional and verbal power. Today, Christianity stands at the head of this country. I pledge that I will never tie myself to those who want to destroy Christianity. We want to fill our culture again with the Christian spirit. We want to burn out all the recent immoral development in literature and the arts and the press. We want to burn out the poison of immorality which has entered into our life and our culture. Now you take those words at face value. I suspect they resonate with a lot of you. And here's what one listener said when he heard them. This puts into words everything I have been longing for for years. It is the first time somebody gave form to what I want. And I suspect many today would say the same. The words are Adolf Hitler's. The listener was someone in the audience who made the comment to Goebbels. Goebbels was Hitler's minister of propaganda and clearly a very, very good one indeed. The words were spoken to German citizens beaten down by World War I, humiliated, longing for dignity, wanting food on the shelves and security. And emotional power and verbal power touched those longings. And humans heard what they longed for and they immediately trust that the words are backed by a character of integrity. The German people and the German church followed those words stated with great emotional power directly into great evil and off a cliff that still affects generations with trauma. Human power is a formidable thing. Knowledge, intellect, skill can also bring power. If I'm smarter, or if I know more, or if I have a certain skill, then I have more power in those arenas. There are those who have theological power over others. It is assumed that they know more about God and that they have the right to tell us what is true about God. 
So the power of a pastor in a theological realm is intensified by the fact that many see him as speaking for God. And indeed, in some cases, he may tell them he's doing exactly that. Some of us have what you might call psychological power, just a knowledge of others, uh, the way people work and think and react that others don't have. And it can include a, a knowledge about how to maneuver, manipulate, or shift people. Many of us experience this kind of am, am, imbalance of power regarding knowledge when we're ill. You know, you go to the physician, and it's, you know, he's here and, or she's here and you're here, right, in terms of power. Because not only do they tell you what's wrong, they also are going to tell you what to do about it. And you're the vulnerable party. There's also power of position. Position can be literal, like president, or CEO, or pastor, or therapist, or doctor, or parent. But it can also extend to the power of reputation or status. Those who are labeled by others uh, as brilliant or godly or successful or who will make it all better for everybody are accorded power simply by virtue of their reputation. They can walk into a room and because of that reputation, people give their words and actions a certain weight or power and like Germany, they do it without waiting to see if there is integrity of character behind it. It is critical to note that very often multiple kinds of power are combined in one person. You think about it. Position combined with a large and or dynamic physical presence, verbal skill, knowledge, the capacity to sway people emotionally, you put all that together in one person, you have a phenomenal combination. So for example, let's take a dynamic physical presence, an articulate voice, emotional sway, and theological knowledge, and roll it all together in the position of pastor, and stick that person in a room with a female, who's usually less powerful physically, a parishioner who has less power in position, whose struggle or pain has rendered her somewhat inarticulate and who is theologically uncertain and struggling and you have a setup for the abuse of power. Words, knowledge, skill, position, and emotion can all be used in concert to move or convince another human being who is vulnerable. Or take a teacher or dorm parent in a boarding school or an adult with knowledge who's in a powerful position, put them in a room or a home with a child who's away from its parents. It's not hard to, hard to see how verbal, physical, and sexual abuse can occur in those places. Or you take the leader of a country who promises everybody freedom and food and jobs and dignity and all those things, and vulnerability, isolation, neediness, ignorance, emotional pain, and a lack of power make any individual in that country susceptible to being abused. Now there's another kind of power, I think, that it's very critical for this audience to understand, and that's the power of culture. Culture can be used, obviously, to refer to a country or a geographical region, an institution or a family, and you and I live and imbibe culture on multiple levels all the time. And we often accept their trappings without assessment. I mean, it just is what is, right? One of the, one of the difficulties and one of the wonders, I find, of traveling around the world is that you, the lens through which you see yourself and your cultures is often changed, uncomfortably so sometimes. So you walk into a culture and you see grace and hospitality poured out like water from people who have very little of this world's goods. Or you see and hear music and dance and art richly shared and it gives you new eyes to see God's beauty expressed in very diverse ways. You've also had your heart broken as I did when someone said to me, Diane, incest is simply part of our culture. Or a pastor who loves the same God you do, who heatedly tells you that it is right that a 14-year-old girl who's been raped must marry her rapist so the family does not have shame to carry. The changed lens has led me to look much more carefully at the power of my culture in my life both secular and religious. 
And I fear as human beings, we are easily seduced by the culture in which we have marinated. We breathe it in so easily, it becomes part of us without thinking. And as we imbibe our cultures and we breathe them in from birth until death, we are shaped by them. And because the culture is simply what we know or are familiar with, we can easily be blinded to it, oblivious to the toxins we ingest, but also the toxins that grow within us and around us and which we transmit to others. The power of culture is great and frequently unexamined. You think about it. Suppose you're a young black male in the United States living in an, in an inner city in the midst of great poverty. You have no idea who your father is. You have never known an adult male who was nurturing or who held down a regular job. You literally do not have a file in your mind for a man being those things. So how can you aspire to them? How can you have any idea where the road might, what the road might really look like to achieve such things? The power of generational poverty and traumas and violence and abuse, as you know, control many, many people in this world. It's the only culture they know. I mean, how, how do you know sexual abuse is an aberration? How do you know it's an evil if indeed it's simply part of the culture? How do you grasp that domestic violence is an abuse of power when you have never known a human being, a female human being who was not beaten? And all the men and religious leaders in your life sanctify it with words from the scriptures. The power of culture is profound and increases exponentially when it is baptized with church or theological leaders. <coughs> The teachings and rulings of a given culture can be a form of systemic abuse. Those of you who were here a, a couple years ago I spoke on systemic abuse, and you may recall that the meaning of the word system in the Latin is together stand. So the culture, its traditions, its primary voices stand together and legitimize domestic violence or rape or incest and often the church stands together with the culture, echoing that belief and supporting it with verses from the scriptures. That's tremendous power. Very difficult and very slow to change, as many of you have found. When speaking in Brazil many years ago, a pastor came up to me afterwards and he said this, Diane, I moved my family to a small fishing village on the coast to start a church. All the men in my village are alcoholic, no exceptions. All the men in my village beat their wives, no exceptions. All the men in my village have sex with their, children, their daughters, no exceptions. Can you tell me, Diane, how to help my people? <laughs> it was the culture they breathed from birth to death over generations, no exceptions. And in probing, I discovered he meant the judges, the lawyers, the police, the pastors, no exceptions. It was what men do. They didn't know what different looked like. In speaking with people from Romania, whose families endured both Stalin and Ceausescu, <clears throat> they say that their parents often still long for that era of oppression. Why? Because they have never learned how to think independently because it wasn't permitted, and they feel utterly overwhelmed by choices. And so they want life to be simple again, and somebody just to tell them what to do. Their freedoms were burdensome to them. The power of culture is insidious. It simply is what is. It is the air you breathe, and it is hard to imagine otherwise. You cannot assess its presence or power, its goodness or evil nor can you aspire to something else in any concrete fashion without somebody illuminating what just is and also illuminating another way. The damages of the abuses and the corruptions and the evils is great and it comes down, as you know, generation after generation after generation and there's no way to even name them, let alone fight them. If you live 
in it. You know, the scriptures talk about us living and moving and having our being in God, but in it, we live and move and have our being in culture. It is the air we breathe, and there is little filter for the embedded toxins. And then finally, another kind of power I just want to touch on is the power of withholding. We've mentioned this. Again, we see this often in marriages, withholding words, affection, sex, money, whatever. And the withholding is for the purpose of controlling or coercing the other into doing what we want. Withholding power can be due to great fear also and complicity because the, uh, the choice of response is going to cause a big mess. So sometimes we withhold to coerce, other times we withhold out of fear because to speak truth will disturb. But when we stand together with abusive systems and keep silent about those abuses out of fear, we have become complicit with the abusive system. And the meaning of complicity is to be folded up with. So we have let ourselves be folded up with the abuse that's going on. So we withhold our power to speak, to name, or to validate victims, which essentially means our power is being used to support the abusive system rather than exercised on, hap on behalf of the victims. So if you heard the talk on systemic abuse, what we also learned is a dissident is someone who sits apart from those who stand together. God calls us to use our God-given power to speak truth, not be silent, to care for the afflicted and needy. And when we do that, we take risks. But when we do that, we are following our Lord by using our power as benediction. It is essentially the voice of the prophet who sits apart and speaks the truth of God into the circumstances while living out the character of God. That is what it means to use power to bless. All right, I want to do one more thing, and then I'm going to turn it over to Phil for a while. I want to talk about the components of the abuse of power. So you understand how people get there, because when we see something really, really awful out here, we just think, how, how did they get like that? So the abuse of power involves three different components. The deception of self, the deception of others, and the coercion of others. An abuser deceives and confuses victims. But the one abusing power is clearly deceived and confused themselves. The abuse of power requires that we deaden our ability to discern good and evil. <coughs> Truth and lies become confused and eventually even reversed. It is very dangerous ground for a Christian. Self-deception works in concert with temptation so that we can convince ourselves of the rightness of something or the goodness of actions that are in fact wrong and somewhere in here we know they are. But we use deception like a narcotic in order to justify our reactions. One of the things we do is say, this, I'm doing this because of something happening out here. The classic case, of course, is domestic violence. I hit her because she, right? Self-deception is like a narcotic injected in order to numb us to the damage and danger of our choices. And if we engage in such self-delusion long enough, we will, over time, lose our taste for good and our power to hate evil. We eventually silence the voice of God in our response of fear to that voice. The problem, of course, is that sin will hurt us. It will lead to death for ourselves and others. But once we begin to deaden ourselves to it and remove our taste for good and remove our power to hate evil, we end up habituating a way of living that results in soul death. Deception becomes a way of life. Evil can be easily practiced by an increasingly dead soul that then becomes presumptuous planning and actively participating in evil. Once we have deceived ourselves, it's really not very hard to deceive others. 
We then take our power, our status, knowledge, whatever we have to cover who we are and to present ourselves as being for others rather than as a user of others. A brilliant preacher cannot possibly be an abuser. A charismatic businessman who's generous with his money cannot possibly be hurting his children. An outstanding coach cannot possibly abuse boys. An articulate political leader who promises food and jobs and whatever else we're longing for cannot possibly mean be, turn out to be a tyrant. We allow ourselves to be deceived by the deceiver because we want what they seem to be giving or seem to promise. We are vulnerable, we are hungry, we are enthralled, and we have been given hope. And so we are led by one we assume who is good, who is in fact a prowling wolf who will either oppress us or devour us. The third component is coercion, which is about restraining or silencing someone or keeping them from acting by using force. The word coerce means to surround. So there's no out. The force use can be physical, obviously. It can be verbal. It can be emotional. We can coerce people by surrounding them with words. That's what that quote with, from Adolf Hitler did. Or the threat of dire consequences. You know, a father to a child he's abusing can force, he can force the child into silence because if you tell, I'll have to go to jail. Coercion is some for, form of force used to make another do something, used to take something from them that is not, not yours. Physical force is obviously the most uh, common force of, of coercion, whether it, you know, you're using a fist or a weapon or brute power or an entire military. But oppression is a more subtle form of coercion. To oppress is to put impossible burdens on people severely weigh them down. It can be carried out through unreasonable laws. It can be carried out by withholding what should be rightfully given. You can coerce through emotional avenues. Anger is often used, rage is the power tool, used to frighten others into obedience. Fear can be used by frightening victims into obedience. So for example, in the Rwandan genocide, if you don't kill your neighbor, we will kill you. Or by showing fear about the ruin that will occur if the truth is told. You know, if you tell about what I just did, my whole ministry is gonna be destroyed. Please withhold your power to speak. That's what that message is. You can coerce through psychological means, such as a threat of exposure or isolation or alienation. A child is easily coerced or oppressed into silence regarding abuse. Told that if he exposes the truth, his mother will no longer love him or somebody will go to jail or he'll have to be taken away from the home, which in fact might be true. A woman can be coerced into silence by her pastor who simply says, no one will believe you. They'll believe me, which is in fact probably true. And certainly entire nations can be forced and oppressed by leaders with military backing and unreasonable laws. Mao Zedong, Stalin, Hitler, Kim Jong-un, there's a long list. Coercion can also involve good things or good intentions. So the one in power holds the follower close by gifts, by affirmations, by money, by the promise of a job. And though it may never be spoken, the threat of the withdrawal of those things is inherent in the giving of them. I'll give you a job in my company. Just don't look too closely at the books. Well, you know if you do, you're going to lose the job. It's often done, of course, by pedophiles and traffickers who groom people with gifts. It's certainly done by political leaders. We coerce by binding someone in our web of deception. Coercion with good intentions can also be easily done by caregivers and counselors. We use our power in the relationship with a vulnerable party to push them towards something we are sure is good for them. And in fact, we may be right. This happens often when uh, I find with counselors who work with domestic violence victims. You know, if a child's being abused, you can pick up the phone and you're mandated to do it. But if you have a 35-year-old woman in front of you who's 
covered with bruises from head to foot and, does, and she doesn't want to go anywhere or do anything, but she's going to leave your office and go back home, you want to coerce her into not doing that because it would be better for her not to go home and get beaten again. But it's coercion. So sometimes our own fears or our desires to care for other people or want them to be safe can lead us to push and prod and use our position and our skills in overbearing ways and even controlling ways with the goal of helping them to safety. The victim is yet again being coerced, being overcome by another and has little to no voice, which is exactly what the perpetrator is doing. The work that many of you do has given you a front row seat to many of the ways in which power is abused. You have witnessed the crushing of human beings created in the image of God. They've been crushed by political systems, by religious systems, by culture, by traditions, by families, individual predators, and a very wrong use of the word of our God. Phil's gonna come and walk us through some exercises with this and then I'll come back and tell you what you're supposed to do with power. Here. Oh, thank you. One of the beauties of the trauma healing materials is that we don't like to just talk at you, but we want adults, especially adult learners, to be actively engaged with the topic. Um, and so just standing up here and giving you lots of good information is not really enough. Uh, so this is the interactive part. <laughs> I'm going to give you some things to be thinking about and you're gonna have a, a few moments of silence to do some things and then we're gonna ask you to do some sharing at your tables. In this little segment, we won't have any large group but in the second one, in the final one, uh, we will do that and have some thoughts to sharing with the whole group. So back to this slide here, which lists some generic forms of power. I'd like you to actually, uh, if you have your pad of paper in front of you, I want to give you one minute, and uh, you can do this at home if you're watching online as well, one minute to list um, have. And these are the, you could actually imagine writing on the left and the right hand sides of this if you, you don't have this, but you can write have. What kinds of power do I have? And let's get specific. In my work and at home in the last month, <laughs> if you want to get that specific, what ones have I expressed uh, rightly or wrongly, but do I own? On the other side, you can say, where am I most vulnerable? Which forms of power do I feel most vulnerable for in the last month? Um, you can choose week if you wish, a shorter time frame. So where do I feel most weak? Where do I feel most powerful? Which expression? So one minute, silent, just go ahead and be thinking about those types of power you might have. Okay, we're going to have Diane uh, come back and talk some more, but I first want just a show of hands. Um, which was easier to come up with a list, the good or the bad? So show me the good. Show me the bad. Which was easier to come up with? Yeah, we, we have lots of examples of the bad. More hands for the bad list is easier than the good list. Um, Part of our job is to look for the good and highlight it because usually they're very hidden. They're not very obvious, right? And so part of what we're going to do next is have uh, Dr. Langberg talk about um, the scriptures that remind us of uh, what good power looks like. All right, I want to give you two scriptures that will guide our understanding of a scriptural use of power. And the first one is from Matthew 28, a very familiar scripture, where Jesus said, all authority, all power is given to me. Therefore, go. And in John 20, Jesus showed his hands and his side, and then he said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Now, Jesus holds 
all authority, he says, all power. That means any little bit that you and I have is derivative. It's not ours. We are dispatched under and with his authority. He does not give authority to us. He retains it. It's his. He sends us out under his authority to carry out his enterprises in his way. Every drop of power that you and I hold is given to us by the one who holds it all eternally. It's not ours, it's his. He has shared what is rightfully his with us. So, are you verbally powerful? The word gave that power to you. Are you physically powerful? The mighty God who breaks down strongholds and sustains the universe gave that power to you. Do you have the power of position? Then the King of Kings and Lord of Lords gave that power to you. Do you have the power of knowledge? The Creator God whose ways are past finding out gave that power to you. Do you have emotional power with others? And the Comforter, the Wonderful Counselor, gave that power to you. Any power that you and I hold is God's and has been given to us to be used by him. It has been given for the sole purpose of glorifying him. It has no other purpose. Second, if all power is derivative, then we will hold that power with great humility. We are creatures, no more and no less. We follow the one who became flesh. He who holds all power said things like this when he was here with us. The son can do nothing of himself. I am come not to do my own will. I seek not my own glory. The state of heart manifested by the son of the father should abound in those of us who say we follow him. We tout our teachings and our writings and our organizations and our reputations. He did nothing of the sort. We seek a share of the glory and the power for ourselves. He humbled himself before not just God, but also man and became a servant. We seek to build our little kingdoms. He came to build the fathers. God gives us power as creatures and it is to be held in trust. And if we understand the nature of power, its source and its dangers, then we will walk humbly before others. For our master has said that if we would be chief, if we would lead and impact others, if we would have power, then we must serve. Before telling the disciples he was sending them out, Jesus said this, see my hands and my side. Those are the marks of his great humility. Those are the visible evidence to us that he came to serve, not to be served. Those marks are the insignia of God's authority. Those who follow him, endowed with his power, are called to serve by way of the cross. There is no other way to serve God and bring glory to him. Third, I think we often make the mistake as humans of seeing power as an external thing. But power is not about having a rule over a spouse or a church or a parishioner or an institution or company or country. It is not external. It is internal. God's kingdom is ever and always the kingdom of the heart. It is not our churches and our institutions and our schools and our ideas. He is building his kingdom, not ours, and he does that by having authority over human hearts to the point that they live lives full of the Spirit of God. That is godly power. And when we are full of God's power, Internally, we bring light and life 
and grace and truth and love into all the external enterprises we're involved in, whether they are great or tiny. And God's kingdom will grow and he will be glorified. Any cause or work that we do, no matter how good it is, that leads us to sin in order for that work to prosper has become an ungodly force in our lives. Any power God has given to us is to be used in conformity to his word and his character. So then how will we serve? Well, we have said that all power is derivative and it's to be held with humility. To what end is this done? Power is to be humbly held in order to love God and then to love others. Its sole purpose is for the glory of God and the good of others. Any time we use power to damage or harm or use someone in a way that dishonors God, we have failed in our handling of the gift of power that we have been given. Anytime we use power to simply feed ourselves or elevate ourselves, we have failed in the gift of power that we have been given. The use of power is always to be governed by the word of God and the spirit of God. And any power that is not subject to both of those things is used wrongly. Any use of power based on self-deception or on some way we've told ourselves that what God calls evil is actually good in the moment is a wrong use of power. Using the power of position to drive ministry workers into the ground for the sake of the gospel is a wrong use of power. Using emotional and verbal power to achieve glory when God says he will share it with no one is a wrong use of power. Using the power of success or financial knowledge to achieve ministry ends without integrity is a wrong use of power using the power of theological knowledge to maneuver human beings to achieve our own ends is a wrong use of power. Using our position in the home or the church to get our own way or serve our own ends or crush others or silence them or frighten them is an ungodly use of power. Using our influence, our reputations to manipulate others to further our ends is a wrong use of power. In addition, the failure to exercise godly power, to withhold it in the face of sin, abuse, tyranny, or oppression, is to sin against a holy God, for we have become complicit and folded up with what he hates with a vengeance. It is, in fact, another kind of abuse of power, for what we have done in those moments is nullified the God-given power in us, given to us so that we will speak his truth, and become a, we become instead a silent oppressor. He says, use your verbal power and open your mouth for the mute. Complicity is a strangling of God-given power meant to be active in this world on his behalf. So godly power is derivative. It is always used under God's authority and its likeness to his character. It is always exercised in humility as his servants first and then like him as servant to others and it is always used for the end goal of glory to God. And he is pleased with only one thing, and that is his son, nothing less. So any deviation in us that is unlike Christ in our use of power does not please God. Our uses of power must look like Christ because he is the one who alone brings God glory. So here is the model for the use of power. Jeremiah 17, 12. <clears throat> A glorious throne on high from the beginning. That's unimaginable power, isn't it? Is the place of our sanctuary. Now you think about power in this world. 
the higher they go in power, the more scarier they get, right? Well, the one who has the highest power, glorious power, from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary, the place of greatest power, the place most exalted is the place of refuge. May our power serve as a refuge around the world on behalf of others. Okay, now here's where it gets real. Um, I'm going to have uh, the audience here. This half of the room is going to uh, begin discussing a few things, and you'll want to have someone be your secretary or in each table who will write down a few thoughts. And on this half, I'm going to give you a different question. So on this half, I actually want you to consider what are some of those wrong uses of power that hold a lot of merit and value in our culture. And of course, our culture is dependent on where you live, who you're around, at your tables as well. So you can take that as widely as you want. These are the deceptions that actually get portrayed as good uses. Let's list some of those characteristics. Um, if you need an example in your mind in order to think through this, think of an organization or a leader who is caring for vulnerable people and maybe there's been some rumblings of criticism and complaint about how um, the ministry is going. What might be some responses that the system or the leader might uh, uh, do that on the surface look really good? But when we begin to examine it, as uh, Dr. Langberg has asked us to do so, we start to see something that looks maybe not quite so good. This side of the room, uh, I want you to say then in that same kind of scenario or whatever, what examples and characteristics can we go further, maybe even scripture passages that might help illuminate the correct use of power with vulnerable people. This is a uh, thing we'll take a lot further actually tomorrow afternoon when we examine it very specifically to our role as facilitators in trauma healing. But today we're thinking more about um, specific characteristics of leaders and organizations who use power well. Uh, so I'm going to give you um, I'm going to give you about uh, eight minutes to discuss this, and then what I'm going to ask is a few of you come to the microphones and give us very brief bullet points of what you guys discussed. Okay, those of you who are going to be speaking for your tables, those that want to at least, please, uh, uh, on this side, make your way to the microphone. Uh, that's over here to the left, and... And we'll do that the same on the other side as well. Okay, so in fact, actually, let's let's speakers come to this microphone here as well on this side. We're gonna we'll play popcorn. Mona, yes. you're ready to tell us an example or two, some characteristics. I mean, of the misuse of power that looks good on the surface but is rotten inside. I am. So our table came up with uh, the main one was. When CEOs or um, it could either be in the secular or in ministries, CEOs of ministries come up with these amazing, grand ideas. We're going to raise $49 million for this building fund, or we're going to have these extraordinary goals because they are the CEO, and of course, God told them. And what happens is that the goal becomes the primary use of you know everyone's day and they and a lot of the people have to sin for example not rest um, you know maybe skew a few numbers here or there so that you can look like you've met the goal the CEO goals All right and um, so I'm sure in your own ministries you can think of that but my favorite is eight is great I, you guys know that Wells Fargo CEO 
Careful, uh, we're in the Wells Fargo building. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> You know, but the Wells Fargo CEO said, yeah, said that, you know, um, made, said that every, every person should have eight accounts. So there, uh, there, there are people had to force people to get new accounts, but. Thank you. Thank you, Mona. Okay, well, well popcorn. So good use. Uh, I'm Anna. I'm representing a table that came up with three characters, all three beings in the Bible that, um, that are good use of power. Uh, we have two who absolutely have all the powers that's listed on that uh, uh, that page um, that Diane showed us is Jesus and Boaz. Okay. Uh, Boaz has all those power, but you know, and sprinkles through the book of Ruth. Um, but most uh, remarkable is uh, chapter three when um, you know um, Ruth was so obedient to Naomi, and it's a very vulnerable moment, and yes. Boaz didn't take advantage of, of her. And then in chapter four, he has to go and. And, uh, and and share this in the in the uh, in the public place, and he allowed that first uh, kinsman redeemer to go first, and he didn't abuse that power. He could have it all uh, sooner. Um, and then through him and uh, Ruth's uh, obedience, that's where the genealogy of Jesus comes. Yeah. And Jesus, of course, yes. you know, you read the Bible, but then chapter 13 of John, um, it talks about Jesus knew where he came from and who he is and where he's going back to. So, not but, he washed the feet of disciples, and he washed also the feet of 12 disciples. He didn't skip Judas. He, wow. he, he, he blessed him. Esther, you Esther. know, women, um, yeah. he did, he, she may not have uh, all those characters, but she made good use of her physical power. Right. And um, her position as a queen, um, her relational or positional power with the eunuch, as well as you know uh, his Jewish people, um, he had. She uses um, the withholding of her power when she could have just nailed it the first night of the feast. She did not. She withheld it and let the Lord spoke to the king. And then the second night, she 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 went for the kill. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Lots of great examples in there. Um, we're going to need some more to have good uses, or else we're going to have a imbalance of bad versus good. Elise. So our table talked about prayer and faith, specifically in how it relates to illness um, and disabilities. And a lot of times families and people are told that if they're sick or if they have a disability, it's because someone sinned or they didn't have enough faith or haven't prayed hard enough in order for it to be, um, for their bodies to be restored or their illness to be healed. Good. Theological. Uh, seeming theological uh, doctrine misused. Sure. Since we only have one, we're going to make you wait because you have to go last. We have to end on a good note. Uh, Richard. Yeah. Um, we were talking about um, missionaries uh, reporting back to their donors and to other interested people and so often give all the success stories. Uh, and there's... Um, there, there are a few safe places, as one of our groups said, for missionaries to be really honest. Mm. <clears throat> to tell those failure stories. Thank you, Yeah, our example is kind of similar to the first, but business leaders who come into companies and um, clean house for the sake of efficiency, mm -hmm. and so they're executing what the board has hired them for, but they leave a wake of, of bodies and people and families hurt in response. Yeah, excellent. The idols of efficiency and authority and getting things done can really uh, rear up, right? Dana. Oh, we have two now, so now we can do a good and so. okay. good. Um, okay, one of ours would be um, an organization having a good practice uh, policies regarding the use of social media if they're working with vulnerable people. How do we use photos? How do we use social media? In a way oh, now that you're protects preaching to us. them. <laughs> right. Um, and also, another one I'll do too um, leaders and organizations that are willing to take responsibility for if it's systemic abuse or whatever abuse of power that has happened. And, and we mentioned Philippians 2 1 and 2 about esteeming others higher than yourself, but um, whatever it means, making restitution, allowing those people to speak out, whatever need to do to help the vulnerable or the victims. 
right? The ability to confess sins that may not be your own, but are a part of your, um, your people. So. Yeah. Yep, we came up with a number of them. Politicians and media who are using their verbal and positional and intellectual power oftentimes to misrepresent the other side and to be divisive rather than using their power to try to work together with the other side. Um, those who are really into an America first posture, they want to use American economic and cultural power to exploit and to get their way in other countries. And then of course the more um, publicized misuse of police power um, that Thankfully, people are beginning to point that out as being wrong, but there's still large camps that are saying, no, you use the power to do whatever you want and to, to get peace right. by whatever means. Right. A good end, therefore, it must be a good use of power. That's one of the, the deceptions. Right. Great. Well, Renee, okay, you might get the last word. We also, of course, uh, was looking at in the scripture about in Jesus how he... Um, took the least of these. I mean, he rose up the value of children. He rose up the value of women by saying, unless you are like the least of these. And so those with the least power he brought up into, into the light. And with the women, even like the intellectual power, he used his intellect. He saw the woman at the well who had you know, thoughts of, you know, you worship there, we worship here. So she was very intellectually engaged. And he uses his intellectual finesse to bring her around to you know, true worship. And, and a person came to mind that we know of, the, of using power well, and we thought of Harriet in her position with the, power, with the trauma healing program that, I mean, I know personally, I've seen her, this is my last word, um, seen her working with two different Bible societies and empowering them, not telling them, not dictating how they need to do it, but saying, how would you do it, and giving them permission to develop it their way, and I think that's, we were in agreement that that is true. Kudos so to Harriet. It's a good model for us to see using power to bless and empower them. So Very good. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's more coercion that goes on there. Oops. Well, we don't want we don't want any more bad ones, I guess. If your mic doesn't work. There we go. <laughs> so we talked about you know some of the ways that people um, kind of misuse power, but it's acceptable in some ways, like shaming people. To do something, coercion, uh, mm -hmm. the coercion aspect of things, and uh, not responding to complaints um, or problems, uh, withholding information. I think it was mentioned before about not sharing the stories that uh, the failure stories. So, excellent. I want to leave you with one Bible passage to think about that shows up in our trauma healing materials, and that is the Act Six story. We have a problem, a conflict between a minority population and a majority culture population. Uh, Hebraic uh, widows and Grecian widows. How do those leaders who are hearing the conflict respond? What is their use of power? Notice um, that they pay attention to what is most important that God has called them to do, which is the prayer and reading and preaching of the word. And they empower um, the people to solve the problem, rather than say, we'll go and study it and we'll get back to whether or not there's a real problem. They actually give power, and if you look at the list of the names, actually the minority population seems to be quite empowered to ensure that their widows are getting the proper amount of food in the distribution. So think about other Bible stories as we go throughout the week, uh, and we're talking about power that reveal to you this image of Christ's use of power in a derivative form that gives him honor, right? And now Harriet gets the power of the lectern. <laughs> Thank you. So that is our keynote address, um, using power in ways that really reflect the kingdom of God. It, it is wonderful when you experience it or see it even in small ways. So thank you for all you're doing to help that happen in more places in contrast of ISIS and other abuses of Boko Haram that are just the polar opposite.